And this is um, our third event um, in the series of Camden and Leeds seminars. So um, I wanted to say uh, welcome to everyone. The seminar is recorded, so hopefully colleagues will be able to see it that aren't able to join us today. Um, it's great to have you with us all here. Um, and today we're going to look at uh, social care and the urgent need for reform in the social care sector. Um, and I'm sure we'll all be able to reflect on what we've learned during the course of the pandemic um, about the relationship between the state, communities and individuals and about the different ways of thinking about public services. Um, and for me, the, the pandemic has highlighted how important that connectedness within communities is for protecting our most, our most vulnerable citizens. But it's also reminded me of the strength of our communities and of, of, our, of the individuals that we work with. Um, and I think it's also kind of worth pausing here and saying what enormous um, contribution everyone in the social care sector made. Um, each and every day uh, to deliver us through the pandemic and how grateful we are. Um, I think the kind of the extraordinary mobilisation of community support during the pandemic was successful because we have those relationships with people um, rather than seeing people as units of need that need to be managed. And um, it's the way it's how we need to shift, continue to provide social care so that the approach is one centered around people rather than markets and shaped by genuine participation. And it brings the power of communities, but also the power of individuals into our, our daily delivery. Um, so lots of people are talking about emerging from the pandemic and the opportunity to radically rethink not just um, who pays for, but how we pay for care and what the social care system is for and, and what it does for society. Um, and I think that uh, our opportunity today is that we've got people here who've already been doing that radical thinking and that kind of bold collaborative leadership. So we're very lucky um, to have our panel and I'm particularly excited that we've also got one of our Camden residents, Alice, who's going to talk to us today about some of her own experiences. Um, so we're going to start um, in a few minutes hearing from Jess McGregor and Kath Roth, who are the Camden and Leeds Directors of Adult Social Care, and they're going to share their perspectives on the current state of the sector and what reform of the sector would look like. Then we'll spend some time with Alice, our, who is our Camden resident, and she's going to particularly talk about her experience of family group conferencing, social care services and her life in Camden. And then we've got an amazing panel of experts and practitioners. So we've got Cormac Russell, who's the Managing Director of Nurture Development, and he's a faculty member of the Asset-Based Community Development Institute at DePaul University in Chicago. And Nurture Development support local communities and civic organisations so that they can develop inclusive community-driven change. And we've got Val Hewson, who's the Chief Exec of Carers Leads, and that's an independent charity that gives specialist support to unpaid carers and who works with community groups businesses and a voluntary sector to give uh, carers in Leeds a cut the support network um, that they need. And then we've got Trisha Pereira and she's the Director of Operations at Skills for Care. Trisha's also previously held a number of senior social care roles in Greenwich, Lewisham and Merton. Um, and Skills for Care is an independent charity supporting workforce development in the social care sector and it supports adult social care employers to recruit and develop and lead their staff. And then we've got Councillor Georgia Gould, who's the leader of Camden and the chair of London Councils. And Georgia has made tackling injustice and inequality of wealth, income and health and influence the focus of the council's work. And um, then we've got Councillor James Lewis, who's the leader of Leeds Council. 
Um, and we've um, got the chair of this of today's session, who is Tom Riordan, who's the chief exec of Leeds Council. Uh, so we've got packed agenda, but I just want to hand over now to um, Jess and Kath, who are going to take us through their reflections on social care. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm going to kick us off and then Kath is going to um, uh, come in uh, after a few of the slides. So um, I'm Jess McGregor. I'm the Director of Adult Social Care in Camden uh, and I'm really delighted to be here today and to be part of this really important conversation. Um, I have to say it's also been a real treat to work with Kath um, and learn much more about some of the great stuff happening in Leeds. Um, I'm going to have to say next slide, please. I'll try not to feel self-conscious every time I say that. OK, so uh, as Kath and I were chatting about what we wanted to uh, focus on today, we we thought a bit about should we try and give you a definition of adult social care as a way of getting started? And actually, we both felt that there probably wasn't a better definition around than the brilliant vision set out by the equally brilliant Social Care Future Coalition. Um, and I'm I'm not going to read this out to you, but I guess there's two things that really jump out at us about this. So I think it's worth noting what's not mentioned. So uh, the people who have come together to to develop this vision aren't drawing our attention to services to care homes, to hospital discharge, to safeguarding, to eligibility. Actually, what's mentioned here is, is people, lives, love and communities. And I think for us, adult social care is really about the most fundamental things in life. And this is a, a really great um, uh, definition, for want of a better word, of that. I, uh, it's worth noting, obviously, that sometimes in pursuit of this vision, we do need to think about services or safeguarding or what people can't do. But uh, by no means is that the majority of what we do and nor should it be what defines us. Next slide, please. So in thinking about adult social care now, I think it's worth reflecting back to 2014 and the CARE Act. Um, which was a really pivotal moment, I think, for adult social care, um, represented a fundamental and welcome change to both the legal and policy context in which we work. And I think also provided hope. Um, I mean, that branding care and support is changing, which I haven't seen for a while, you know, reminded me of how I felt in, the, you know, at the time that we were implementing the CARE Act. Uh, and I think it's worth saying we've seen really significant and positive change and in particular um, you know, this has driven, I think, the way in which we are all working towards taking a strength and asset based approach. Um, it's focused our minds on our new duties around preventing things going wrong and maximising well-being in everything that we do. Um, you know, we've embraced people who perhaps before uh, weren't embraced by adult social care. So people in prison with care and support needs, um, all of which has uh, been really positive. However, I guess that has also been in tandem with an ageing population, uh, years of austerity, and so lots of that is getting harder and harder to do. Uh, and, and I guess on reflection, the, the kind of picture of where we are now is not the one we were hoping for seven years ago. Um, on top of that, I guess um, we need to reflect on the last year and the pandemic as well, um, and that does overlay all of this. Uh, you know, COVID has presented us with both immediate but also enduring challenges and pressures. We've learned a huge amount about disproportionality and inequalities, and I think that is leading us to ask questions about some of the very things we've been proud of over the last um, few years. Uh, and, and much of what is set out on the slide, which definitely represents the challenges we're currently facing, has also been exacerbated by COVID. Next slide, please. So I think we're pretty clear about what we want from adult social care reform, and I don't think it's it's really rocket science. I suspect there's nothing on here that you wouldn't expect to see. And actually, when Kath and I were talking about what, what we wanted to say about this, it probably only took us one or two minutes to come up with the list. Um, 
again, I'm not going to read it out and, and we're going to go through each of the kind of key ingredients um, in a bit more detail shortly. But I think there is one point that I did really want to emphasise here, which I think is sometimes lost um, from some of these conversations about adult social care reform, which is, um, I guess, the rights dimension to what we do. So if we go back to the social care futures vision where we're talking about uh, what's important to people, we could almost replace uh, the phrase we want with we have a right and no one would, would disagree with that. Um, I think some of our most basic human rights are covered in that statement from social care futures and that the things that people with care and support needs are telling us they want are those most basic fundamental human rights. So I think that the kind of imperative for us is to ensure that our work recognises, supports and protects those rights, but also that we don't infringe on them ourselves with the kind of well-intentioned support, services, safeguarding measures that we might be putting in place. Uh, so fundamentally, we've got to work hand in hand with people, co-creating solutions, persistently focusing on what matters most to them, and any reform of adult social care absolutely has to be built on these principles. Next slide, please. So in terms of our key ingredients for reform, um, it won't surprise anybody that our starting point is, is this. It's about working from a strength based perspective, seeing people and their communities as assets. Um, I think there's something so powerful about the, the, the focus on what matters to you rather than what's the matter with you. Um, and it's much repeated because of how powerful it is. Um, I, I think it underpins the work we do directly with residents day to day, but also the way in which we think about adult social care and the more strategic work that we do um, with partners as well. And for me, taking a strength based approach is about early conversations with people when things are tricky moving towards emphasising those prevention and wellbeing duties in the CARE Act over eligibility, uh, knowing when our role is, is to be more active, to be more nurturing, but also when actually what we need to do is get out of the way, um, and beginning to develop new approaches and interventions that are orientated around that. And, and we'll shortly hear about um, family group conferencing in Camden and uh, meet Alice, who is our local celebrity. And I have to say, I've only been in Camden a year, so I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Alice yet. So I'm really looking forward to that session. Um, and then finally, I think building on that long and rich expertise um, that comes from local authorities and local authorities work in this area around community development, taking asset based approaches um, and beginning to cement adult social care perhaps more firmly um, right at the heart of local authorities and linked to that that broader history. And I'm going to hand over to Kath now. Thanks, Jess. So next slide, please. So on our, our menu of reform, uh, we couldn't not mention the home care and uh, we need to radically change how we approach supporting people who live in their own homes. Time and task, which is how we currently commission, um, atomizes people. It reduces them down to, you know, 30 minute slots. It stopped being holistic a long time ago. We need to move to a model of community well-being that has a real focus on promoting independence. And it has to be holistic. Uh, we know really well that you may have two people living with the same long term conditions, but if one person has a network of family and friends and the other one is isolated and lonely, we know which person is at greater risk of perhaps a hospital admission or a breakdown of care. So in Leeds, we, we talk about having the ambition that everybody needs three good friends. And how do we weave that into our, our work with individuals to have a, a rich and fulfilling life. Alongside that, I think we've got to get better at using technology. And I don't just mean the sort of assistive technology that we would recognise we can get from our community equipment stores, but the everyday technology, the power of what's in our smartphones, in our Alexas, 
um, and to, to be able to use that for good and to help people stay connected and part of their communities. And I, I guess COVID gave us a real fast learning curve in how to use that effectively in a way probably I would never have done if it hadn't been for COVID. And an absolutely key part of this, and this will be a recurring theme, it keeps coming up in all our slides, there has to be a salaried workforce with improved terms and conditions of service. If we don't value our staff and the workforce, how can we expect that then to com convert into valuing people? So next slide, please. So alongside the care and support people have, I always say that community care is the right roof over your head with the right care and support in the right neighbourhood. And we, if you look at how our demography is changing um, with the number of older people, which will be increasing, we absolutely need a national housing strategy for an ageing population. And within that, we need a sort of ladder of I won't call it intervention, but a ladder of housing with support models that apply not just to older people, but to working age adults as well. And increasingly, we see care homes being the place where people are living with dementia end up. And I guess I've put a challenge out today. How can we develop more homely models of support for people living with dementia so that couples who've been together 60, 70 years don't have the heartbreak? of being separated because somebody's support needs require them to move to a home to get the care they need. And I guess a corollary of that, really a question mark, has residential care had its day? You know, is it is it on the clock? Do we eventually see a point where it's no, no longer relevant? So next slide, please. So inclusive growth is really important. People forget, or it, it doesn't seem to feature in national government narrative, how, how important social care is as a major employer, um, contributing positively to uh, the, the growth of the country. But that has to be linked to improved pay and terms and conditions. And one of the things that I've been trying to make the case for in my ADAS role is if you increase the wages of our entry level staff, then you will save money on pension credit, uh, not pension credit, so working cre tax credits, because people have more money in their pocket. It's a positive thing to do, because when we look at the nature of poverty in this country, a lot of it is in work poverty and social care staff will be amongst that workforce. Alongside that, we absolutely need a, a national workforce strategy, and I'm delighted that Trisha's joined us today, and I'm looking forward to, to what she might have to say on this, because I'm sure she'll be right behind us on it. People need to see social care as a positive career with a, a, a decent career pathway, and we just simply don't have that. But we also want to link those employment opportunities to our most deprived neighbourhoods and how we can act as a stepping stone into work for, for some of those people who are perhaps furthest away from work. And when we look at who's involved in delivering care, we've got to ensure that we have a workforce that reflects the population we serve. So how do we improve both the cultural competence of our mainstream providers, but also nurture Black, Asian, minority ethnic entrepreneurs to come forward. And we know in Leeds, by looking at our own data, that we have a gap there and this is something we need to do. And if you're of working age, really your aspiration should be that you are in work. So how can we work better both locally and with national organisations and, and like the DWP to get better pathways into work for those working age adults who might be living with a disability or mental health support needs, but with the right support can be constructively employed and contribute to their communities. And we want to think about how might we magnify those opportunities by increasing our, our integration with the NHS. Next slide, please. So reform of the care market, this is, this is long overdue and we really do need to improve the regulation oversight of who can be a care provider. I personally never want to go through another Southern Cross, Four Seasons or Allied Healthcare experience. It cannot be that we end up with models that leave us so fragile. 
So that investment, I think, that we're calling for, we need a, a, a national injection of cash now just to stabilise the sector, but then long term decent investment, which we're absolutely confident will drive quality. Link that to your local workforce strategy alongside a national workforce strategy and really challenge yourselves about new models of care and support that enable people to remain living in their own homes. We have seen a real acceleration of citizens choosing not to go in a care home and want to remain living at home. And we've managed that successfully. And uh, I certainly have seen a, a real increase in uh, demand for home care, people not wanting to go into a care home. And, you know, we, we see that market reform, the way we do it has got to both deliver and promote social value and contribute to resolving the climate emergency. Next slide, please. So there's always a lot said about um, integration with the NHS, and I always use as my poll star the National Voices definition of integrated care, which is that I can plan my care with people who work together to understand me and my carers, allow me control, bring together services to achieve the outcomes that are important to me. And if we hang on to that as our a sort of pole star, then how we develop integration with the NHS, I think we've got to, a lot to bring forward in terms of our guiding principles, our reform priorities, uh, that it's very much collaboration where it makes sense and that we do the interventions and responses when we can add value to citizens' lives. There's always an assumption that there is a massive overlap but every time I've looked at this, and I've looked at it for 35 years now, that our sort of areas of overlap are about 10 to 15 percent. There is much that we do that is autonomous, and we just need to make sure we don't sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater with how we come together. What I would say is that when you think about integration, you have to bring the whole of local government to that in terms of thinking about all the things outside of pure social care that allows a citizen with care and support needs to live a fulfilling life. So if we go to the final slide, please, I'll just finish off with um, the, the vision statement. This is what we're after. It's not a big ask, is it? But it feels really hard to achieve at times. And I'll leave it there and hand back to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm handing over to Tom now. Thanks, Jenny, um, and thanks uh, for that brilliant presentation. How uh, how to get a really focused and succinct and you know um, thought provoking view of this massive issue for us. You know, thank you so much to both of you. Now, the the panel that we brilliant panel that we've got are now going to get their biggest challenge, which is this is the quick fire round. So we're going for a really just quick one issue um, reaction to what you've just heard. And then we're going to hear from Alice and then we'll come back to the panel for more, more discussion. But um, just a quick reaction from each of you, if you could, um, starting with, with Georgia. Can you uh, can you hear me OK? Hello, can you hear me OK? I'm just Georgia, do you want to go first in terms of a quick reaction? Sorry, Sorry my, my network's really bad. It just completely cut out. I didn't realise you were talking to me. Sorry. I didn't know whether you couldn't hear me or I couldn't hear you. Sorry, go for it. He's got most of a minute already, so uh, and I know that Tom doesn't believe I can I can say anything quickly, but I think um, really thank you for just like the, the the amazing work, and I'm lucky enough to see the the Camden side of it um, deeply every day, and and to have learned a bit from Leeds. I think the the two things that really kind of struck me from from that are firstly the the kind of huge national importance of, of social care, both the workforce, the job opportunities. Uh, but also all of the, the contribution that unpaid carers um, and communities make to this and that this 
this really is the moment that we need to address this huge national challenge and, and fund it properly. Uh, but also, I was really happy to, to have it start and end with love and communities and people and, and human rights. And I think if I've learned anything from the work that our teams have been doing is that is that the most powerful work is through relationships and um, and and love and care and understanding communities and doing that really deep uh, scam based work. So that that is that's the you know that my I think the danger is we look at reform is that we sent if we completely centralise it and lose that that connectedness into into communities. Brilliant, thanks, Georgia. Um, Councillor Lewis, James, do you want to go next? Thanks, Tom, and. Um, I'll take your challenge as this being a quick fire um, session and say, I think that um, um, building on what George has just said, you know, I think it is important about the communities where people live. And that's where I think the role of local government is so important in taking this agenda forward. I'm always a huge advocate for the role of elected um, councillors. And we know a lot of our communities better uh, better than anybody else does. In that, um, in that we know um, um, what organisations are there, where connections can be made, how we can bring people together, and 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 what um, and, and what people in our areas are interested and engaged in as well. And I think that's a really powerful role we can do. And I know um, that the some of the work we've done in these, for example, Huns at um, Huns at Rugby League Club. Um, and I'll explain rugby league to some of our London colleagues in a separate session. But it is a um, um, it's a sport that's very um, rooted in industrial communities in the north, and they you know they do a um, obviously before um, um, coronavirus a a, 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 a a session where older hundred supporters could come together and talk about um, um, and talk about um, the. Um, talk about um, supporting the club in the 50s and 60s and um, um, earlier than that when they, were, when they were one of the biggest clubs in the country um, and sing their club song which names completely I was born on the north side of the River Air so that doesn't make me a Hunslet fan um, but that was a um, you know things like that that um, um, that that the, the, a national strategy or delivered service just simply could not do so my very quick take around everything has been said actually it's the role of us as local councils and uh, and um george and myself and i can see there's some councillors watching as well our role of local councils and knowing our communities great thanks very much carmack it's brilliant to have you here um do you want to go next can we hear can others hear carmack okay because i can't no. No, we can't hear. We'll just we'll come back to you, Carmack. I'll just try. Um, actually, do you want to go now? Can you hear me OK now? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. We can hear. so just to say great to be with you and great to to hear the presentations. What's refreshing is this de-emphasizing of the institution. And the refeaturing of community and refeaturing people who need support as citizens rather than as clients of the system. So the language is really refreshing. And it's interesting we talk about reform because if you go back into the late 70s, certainly in, in Leeds and Wakefield, you'd have had patch social work. Social workers would have been working very much on the idea that if you animate the community, you create a whole set of possibilities that mean people can live interdependent lives with supports that supplement those lives. Uh, and I, I think the loss of that and the disinvestment of that, and this isn't a political point at all, obviously, I'm calling in from Dublin here today. So this is almost universally the case over the last 40 years, that systemically we've seen, you know, the disinvestment of place-based ways of working uh, across all kinds of public sector, public sector intervention, and we absolutely need to reinvest. Um, so I, I think that's the key takeaway for me, that we can't disconnect community development, economic development and social care. And I would say that the future protagonist, it's, it's, a, it's a profound error actually to make the so-called end user 
the primary protagonist. They have enough stress on their shoulders. So I'm not sure I agree with social care futures in that narrative. Nor do I think it's fair to say that the institution should be the primary uh, protagonist. I think communities with people who need support should be the primary uh, protagonists and institutions, public sector should be there to support and serve and supplement. But that takes investment, that takes capital investment. So I hope as well as supporting communities, we're seriously interested in investing in community development and, and good social care. Brilliant. Thanks, Carmack. Um, let's go to Tricia next. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so for me, I really, again, like um, Cormac said, and I echo everything that Cormac has already said, but um, especially the use of language and moving away from the focus on services as the main narrative and um, reflecting on the ambitions of the CARE Act, as Jess started with her introduction. The, thinking about the ambitions of, of the care act as leverage, we've had 30 years of the care management approach. So, and it's that transactional model. So we're having to turn a big ship around. It will take time, but the pandemic has provided us, provided us with the opportunities to really pick up pace. We've seen um, over the past year that we can do things quite rapidly. We've seen a real surge of mutual aid and community support, but the infrastructure hasn't been there. Um, I was invited to be co-chair of one of the advisory groups to the task force and it was at the Baymouth Communities Advisory Group and there was lots of really positive messages and feedback from various community groups and individuals around the, the community model and the mutual aid model but again as Cormac said the infrastructure needs to be bolstered and developed the funding needs to be there as well I really welcome the reform of home care and as Kath said the homely models of care for promoting independence. I love that. Um, and the three good friends model as well. I'd like to hear more about that because during the pandemic, um, I became carer for my aunt who was, she's just recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And as a carer, um, building on the relationship or forging the relationship with her formal carers, the paid for carers, myself as an informal carer, um, and with the care agency and the social worker and the health professionals, it's been invaluable for me as a carer whilst working in the system, but also drawing on services. It's been quite a, um, a unique and dynamic experience for me after working in the system for 20 years. But I really welcome that. I've seen the positives of the opportunities that the pandemic has brought. Thank you, Tricia. And um, last but not least, Val, that's a really good way into um, to hear from you. It is. Thank you. And it's, it's lovely to be here. And thank you for the invite as well, because I always think to myself, I'm just kind of a regular third sector organisation in Leeds. But two reasons I love working in Leeds is the first thing is, as a third sector, we've been around every virtual table from the start of the pandemic and before. So we've really been seen as equal partners in actually finding solutions and way that us, based in our community, can actually tell some of our city leaders the messages we're hearing. And that's been really welcomed as third sector organisations. And the second thing is, is, is that they've recognised that often in the third sector, we know our people, we know our communities, and we can turn things around on a sixpence if we need to, because we've kind of got the, uh, the confidence in Leeds that we can do it and we're trusted to do it. So there are two reasons why I particularly have, ha have got a lot out of working um, across social care and the third sector and hopefully health as well. And we know that it's an essential part of our society. It's what we've heard from, from our presenters already. It helps people live the best lives, where they want to live with the people around them. Around them. But, and it is so much more than sets of services that we give people. It's really about making people feel, feel valued and people feel heard. But we can only help people feel heard if we ask them the question. It's not about telling people what they can have or what's the menu of services, but it's about having good conversations and listening to what people are saying about what matters to them. But I think often when people come into social care, they're at the most vulnerable. They're the least equipped at that point to deal with services and 
conversations and assessments and everything else, which is why we stress all the time about the prevention agenda and the real basis of what community work is like. So we can really nail the prevention. So people, we try and they don't get to the crisis because a lot of people, I think even now, don't really know what social care is. They link it with health and social care. Is it free? How do I get it? What do I need? People don't know what they need until it's offered to them. And I think we know the pandemic's taken a huge toll on social care and, and, and the funding gap we have now. But I have to end this little bit by saying that beyond 2021, if we don't do something, if we don't heed what we're saying about social care reform, then, and it collapses, then where will the, the the impact hit? It will hit the shoulders of unpaid family carers. And that's the greatest strength. It's an asset in our community. It's a strength in our community. But we have to also respect in our community the strength of unpaid carers. And I think the last 18 months, if we hadn't had unpaid carers, basically, you know, um, um, keeping people away from frontline services, then NHS and added social care would have would have collapsed without that response. So there is, you know, there is something about seeing unpaid carers as a great strength, a great asset, but also supporting them as well, because um, to do the very best if they want to for the person they care for. So that's uh, that's from a, a third sector leads perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Val. What a great set of um, introdu introductory comments from all of you. So um, I've, Chris has put a comment on the chat, um, a question on the chat. And if we can, if you'd like to ask any questions, just use the chat um, and we'll pick them up later. And we're now going back to uh, to Jenny to hear from uh, from Alice, which we're all really looking forward to. Yeah, we're looking forward to it and um, we're really lucky to be joined by Alice, um, Alice Berko, one of our Camden residents. Um, and I am going to give you a short introduction, but of course the panel has given us a short introduction to um, particularly, I think what Val was just saying, to kind of what the aspiration is whenever we meet one of our residents um, like Alice. So Alice has lived in Camden since the 1970s. She um, has had a variety of jobs and worked hard here, and she got married and had her two daughters here. Uh, she's a connoisseur of jollof rice and dancing, and apparently these will be featured in, in the video. Um, but when Alice began to struggle with her physical and mental health, um, she came and was supported by Camden's integrated care multidisciplinary team. And what, them, what they found was that although Alice has um, a huge world of neighbours and friends and support from her church, um, her, her social worker, Martin, found they weren't coordinated in any way. And so um, this is where Alice became one of the very first residents in Camden to take part in adults um, family group conference. And, um, which brought Alice's network together to support her after years of her supporting so many people in her community. Um, and so we're going to show the short video of Alice's family group conference. Um, and then we're going to hand over to Martin, Alice's social worker, and I'm going to talk to Alice and Azara. And Azara is Alice's family group conference coordinator. So we'll just run the video first. Um, had always told me that, that, that she'd be very happy to dance and she certainly danced on that occasion. And the other thing she said, which I thought was interesting, she said, welcome to my neighbourhood, which I thought was lovely and I thought actually was right because it was her neighbourhood and when all the people had gone, she was still there.
I initially came to to meet with Alice because she there were some concerns, uh, health concerns about her. In the process of showing me photographs, she showed me one very beautiful, poignant photograph of herself and her husband getting married. I think it was at some point in the 50s with the root master bus behind them. There were photographs of her leaving the block, going out. She loved going dancing with her friends and she was the caretaker of that block. So the assets are in the community and that goes back to what Alice said when she said welcome to my neighbourhood. There's a really interesting shift there which um, which which comes from the FGC. It's come from the That's how I remember this, this <laughs> tenacious, really sort of direct, forceful, but in a friendly kind of way, person that you were and you still are. Initially I was very sceptical, some sort of um, ruse to deviate from social pack when it was explained to me that it's actually about getting family and friends together to better identify how we can all support her, which we do anyway, but do it in a more coordinated approach, that kind of really sat well with me. They act as a group, they make plans yeah. and they support each other. And that really seems to have happened in, in Alice's case. One of the neighbours who came to the first one said, this is what adult social care should be about. Alice, I think felt very empowered by the support from the people who were there and and also the fact that we left the room and then came back and she very much had control with those people who she trusted over a, over a plan. And that group of people, they were people mm. from her community, they were friends of hers, they were people that lived locally to her, weren't they? I think the main thing is for me is that, you know, assets are in the community. They are in the community, they are around people. And it's actually for me to act with her and to really seek out and understand what is actually around her and to work with that. When I hear my the music I want, no matter what, I'll get up and dance. And that's me. I love dancing. <laughs> When I first met her, at first she said, oh, I don't know anybody, just a couple of people here and there. And then as we got talking, and I, I, it's my job, I love it. I just love to get more people, so I kept pushing. And then one name popped up, then another name popped up. So many people I didn't even know, although they were living just not far from me, but I didn't know them. It's only because I was just listening, I'm going to know most of them. I knew she was a guardian, um, but I needed, I needed a bit of push for my tree to come back again. So uh, I got there and I spoke English for a bit. So I said to her, look here, we are, we are Santinia, we are, we are Ghana, 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 That which means, if you are Ghanaian, you know, and you meet your Ghanaian, don't speak English, speak your tongue. <laughs> I've never seen so many social workers <laughs> sitting together in one room. So I feel very safe. <laughs>
social work um, degree at London Metropolitan. On a very rainy day, the um, one of the tutors there said, you know, don't worry that social work can be one of the most interesting and fascinating careers that you can do. And um, yesterday I was at Wandsworth Prison um, actually with a client trying to work out who's terrified of being released, trying to work out a supported living placement for tomorrow. And here, here I am today <laughs> with with the lovely Alice and Azara and Tim and, and, and Molly. And um, I was just thinking about what you were saying and I'll just hand over to, to Alice. I mean, <laughs> what, one, one of the things, we're breaking all social distancing rules, by the way. One of the things I was thinking about was what you've all been saying. And um, I was thinking of that thing from the Camden Plan by Lynn, Mar Lynn, Mar Lynn Romeo. And she said that even in the most challenging and difficult times, there are things that we can do to give strength and hope that things are going to get better. And I was thinking also about Albert Camus' book on the plague and, and necessary optimism. And he said that people are always kinder than you think. And one of the things about my relationship with Alice is um, she is one of the um, the, the nicest, um, kindest uh, people, always concerned for, for your neighbours, Alice. And in terms of optimism, Alice gave me some presents. And I know I should never accept presents, but I thought I'd, I would today. And um, she gave the tie here to me, which I think is lovely. And she also gave me this. Would you, would you just like to tell me about this, Alice? You're going to? Yeah, could you just tell me about I'm it? Going to. If you can speak up to, yeah. No, remember. You I was just talking about your back job. Back job. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you carry on. <laughs> carry on. What can I now support you? What can tell me. Well, you tell me how this is made. Plenty it is well, with, with the cotton, ordinary cotton, you know. Yes. Uh, we we'll wear the, the special occasions, parties, and weddings. I don't know how to describe it, but. Uh, that's the most, uh, what should I say, <laughs> Azra? <laughs> You've said the most, it beautifully, what's that? And we were we, we, back home, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. And I think you saw somebody in Oxford Street, you were saying, that you saw somebody wearing. Yeah, that's right. Um, and um, immediately I went to him and I said, my, my dear, where did you get this thing from? And what said, did... I've been to Ghana before, and that's why I, I, I bought it. I saw oh, you are so nice. <laughs> Beautiful things, you know, and that's it. And 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 the tie as well. Yeah. It, it's it's the same kind of pattern, isn't yeah, it's it? Plenty, yeah, we, yeah. We have the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And and also um you've also given me this which in terms of necessary optimism that's right. is one of the most beautiful things and it says greetings from ghana yeah. and and actually one of the things that the, i like the, the king there is you know is in, in ghana who's in ghana if you have a visitor the, the person the person does is to offer the person uh, uh, palm wine so the lady is pouring palm wine you know to the visitor so if I come as a visitor to yeah. your home, That's right. whenever I come, yeah. you always offer me something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you always yeah. offer me something. Yeah. And and you never, you always say you must take something. And I say, no, no, I can't take something. And you always say you must take something. Right. But I would be offered palm wine. And is I, I'm sure the people here are getting very, um, you know, thinking about palm wine and perhaps pick, picking up some tonight on the way home. <laughs> but, um, I, it, is it alcoholic palm wine? Oh yeah, it is. It's alcoholic. Yeah, but that, and then we've got some non-alcohol. Yeah. Some alcohol. Okay. Yeah. And what about when you boil it? What happens when you boil it? No, you don't boil the, boil the, uh, mm -hmm. 
Pamwe, it's, it's only when you want to make a petition. Oh, I'm not a petition. A petition. When you call Pamwe, you know, the steam would come up. Yes. A petition. That is very, very strong. It's very strong. That's right. I mean, how strong are we talking about that person? You are doing, doing very well. We are doing very So, so we're talking about one or two glasses or well, uh, appetizer? No, you can't get two glasses. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, so you, you'd, you'd have yeah, to yeah, uh, have, kind of want of uh, uh, half a glass or something like that, that would make you very drunk. And it would make you really drunk. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, so you'd have to be quite careful. But the idea of offering something when somebody comes into your home is right. is, is very important. That's right. So the person you know, you know, think about you, likes you, that's yeah. why it comes to visit you. So immediately the person enters it first thing is to offer the person a family. And you're you're very thoughtful to your neighbours, aren't you, Alice? And you really think about them and care for them. That's an important theme for you, isn't it? Would you like to say something about that? It's a, you've lived there for a long time, haven't you? Sorry? You've lived in Coron Street. Oh yes, I've lived there for seventy-two years now. Right. Yeah. Well, the people are nice to me. Yeah. Naturally. I yes. should, you know, be nice to them too. And do the people recognise you? Oh yes, they do. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah. I used to be the caretaker, the whole block. Right. You know, the Coca-Cola is the opposite. They were, I was there in the hotel. You know, I mean that that flat. You know, okay. forty-eight, fifty-two, Pura Street. You know that building. I used to be in charge. Right. So you were the caretaker. So there must be some people there that were children when you were the were the, were the caretaker. Oh, uh, the children. Yes, they grew up with you there. Oh no, I actually I didn't okay. you know do it. I did it only for a very, very short time, you know, okay. because it was getting too much for me. So I just did it, and then I got a new, yeah, a young man who was more stronger than me. So I, yeah, you know, but if he wanted it, then he said yes, you know. So. Yeah. And you, you gave me a very good recipe for plantains and ginger. Oh gosh. <laughs> and and yeah, it's better than you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And and lately you've been saying that you've lost your appetite a bit, haven't you? Do you do you want to say why why you think that is? I don't know why. Maybe I'm not, maybe mm. because of no my daughter, you know, who passed away, you know, recently, you know, which mm. has made me mm. uh, so that, you know, I don't know how to put it. Mm. Uh, That's okay. That has made me to lose my appetite completely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I saw your other daughter today, Helen. Mm. And Helen's starting to write a lot of things down, isn't she? Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's what she's doing. It's yeah. her uh, work, you know, so that has nothing to do with me. Okay. So, Alice, we, we're here and everybody's been talking about social care. What, what advice would you give to, to people? What would you say in terms of the family group conference with Azara. What would you tell people? Do you think? I know we have been busy with that. Oh, what? Well, oh, okay. No, no. I think what Alice uh, has always said, um, and hi, Azara here. Um, she has brought with her as a Ghanaian the tradition of actually taking care of other people, looking. Uh, after other people and sharing your skills, sharing your knowledge um, and time. And uh, by doing that, then in fact, when I was doing the farm group conference, I got to know a lot of people that she had introduced me to who actually took part in the conference. And one of them um, told me, she's like my mom. So I see her as a mother and everything that she wants, I will do for her. And this guy, John takes Alice to the, to the cemetery 
uh, I think it's once every month, yes, yes, yes. every month to the cemetery to, to, to uh, her husband's grave. Um, another one who is Molly also would come in and sort her. Alice loves plants and flowers, so she comes in to rearrange the flowers in front of her flat and also inside the house. But of course, the pandemic has made it a bit difficult that people are not able to go in as they, they used to do. Um, but um, I did my part and I remember I spoke to her over the phone during the pandemic and when she said that she hadn't been eating properly, we were talking, I'm from Ghana, so and I know that I'm from the north, but those from the south like, um, they like chicken with um, peanut butter soup. So I offered to do that for her. And I took it there and then, you know, we had a little chat and again, I didn't go in, but I, you know, I made sure that um, she got it. Just, just something to show, because I know that she gives a lot and it's also nice for someone to also give her something once in a while. And I think she was so appreciative. She ran back in and came out with this little fan uh, for me. She, she, you know, you can't get away from Alisa without her giving you something. Um, and I think, you know, apart from just the culture, she is that kind of person. And um, this, this being part of this today, I know, because we had to do a lot of pep talks and stuff to her, just to encourage her, um, because um, again, with the pandemic, it's just made her you know, now she doesn't even go out at all. So today was like a little treat for her to come out, uh, although we had to do a lot of convincing for her to actually take, come out and be part of this of this event. Do you want to add anything? Do you have anything to add, Alice? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Alice, can I can I just show this this lovely um, picture oh, of Alice as <laughs> Would you like to just point out, I hope people can say, which, which, is, which is yourself in this picture, Alice? Yeah, this one. That one there. Uh, there you are, that one there. Yeah. And is there anything from, from growing up in Ghana that you'd like to tell us about? Anything like what? Anything from when you grow up, when you grew up or about your father, because I think your father taught you how to, okay. to dance, is that right? Oh yeah, that's what that I learned. My father was very nice and all of yeah. the children, you know, dancing, you know, so they all were always, you know, there was uh, a certain uh, yeah. dancing, they, they call it Konkuma. Okay. Uh, Konkuma. Did you hear about them? Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So my father always, you know, calls me and then they just have to teach me how to dance together. That's why I'm so mad with dancing now. Yeah. Everyone knows that I like dancing. Yeah, so you did great. My father. You did great. It was great. Yeah. Well, you know, th thank, thanks ever so much for, for talking, Anna. It's, it's, it's great. And, and also for coming today and Azara as well. Um, did anybody have any questions for Alice? Could they hear you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're... No question. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> So I hand back over to you. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. you. I think Tom, it's to you now. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Azara. And thank you for all you do. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. That's been a fantastic story for us, and um, so rich in uh, your experiences. We can. Um, there's nothing better to hear firsthand from people and what a, what an inspiring story, um, just wonderful. Um, let's go straight to the panel and talk, reflect a bit about, you know, Alice's experience and situation. I wonder whether Georgia might want to go first in terms of just, you know, the clearly the family group, the power of the family group conferencing was one thing that came across to me, Georgia. I just wondered if you might want to reflect on that. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, yeah, massive thank you to Alice for, for today, but also we've done to, to teach us and our services um, uh, 
uh, about about how to to work better with with people and communities and uh, I I think you kind of heard there I think the, the power of a family group competency model Tim who's here somewhere um, has really been uh, pioneering this for us in Camden and it started with uh, children's uh, social care where we were um, working with with families and communities around children um, and and taking a strengths based approach to um, uh, one where we kind of supported the networks around a, a child um, to to come together and create a plan for for, for that child and, and that family um, and um, we as we kind of started to look at uh, transforming adult social care services a few years ago to a more strength based way we started to test the, the model of family group conferencing and it's it's better called community community group conferencing when it comes to adult social care because it tends to be families and communities and that who whatever network is important to, to that individual and Alice uh, because of her work and her long time in the neighborhood was really strong links to to, to her neighbors in that really powerful way uh, but for other people it might be the local mosque church uh, people that go to the pub with or or family networks and I think uh, I think what's powerful about the model is that the the role of the the council in this and um you know we've we've heard from from martin he's an extraordinary social worker is 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 not to go in and solve things but to to look at the strengths that exist uh for that person and their own relationships and networks to support them to come together and then crucially to to step out of the room and i think that power balance is really important because it's the community or family that that create the plan and then that's presented back to to the council um, and Tim will be able to tell you how many we do, but I think it's become an absolute key and core part of, of our of our model. And uh, uh, the team who've developed it have kind of also working on something called um, Full Circle, which is which is where the community um, come together to solve challenges more broadly. So it's it's been a way of think, uh, thinking differently about our services, and it and it links to taking a strengths based. Uh, approach more generally so the conversations that people go into whoever is that 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 first kind of person and even if it's not a full uh, uh, family group conference is to kind of start to ask about what their strengths are what their own ambitions are and to start with that place and it might be you know I know that there are mod there are times where people have done a kind of just a walk around the neighborhood uh, so people can point out the things that are important to them or gone and visited the community groups that are important to them so it's a it's a really different way of working and I think it, we've the team have been investing in it for a long time and, and you can see uh, how powerful it is and, and how much we believe in it by by the conversation we just had. Yeah, no, we, we uh, the way I always like the description of it is it's like turning a, a meeting with the family from a an, an away match where you're, you know, you're with lots of, pra um, you know, pra um, you know, professionals um, and it's a bit intimidating to a home match where there's more of the family there and, you know, they can dominate the discussion and decide what needs to happen. It's really powerful and empowering in that respect as well. I also heard a rumour that Sal our Sal Tariq was dancing in that uh, video as well, which I've got to see again. I missed that. Um, but Carmack, the, um, the, you know, that focus on community that you were talking about came through really powerfully from, uh, from Alice's um, story. I wonder if you want to come in on that. Absolutely. Well, Alice, Alice is the living embodiment of what I try to uh, in some way celebrate because Alice's life is a life well lived. It's a life where the first thing that she invites you to pay attention to is welcome to my neighborhood. This is my place. I'm a citizen here. I don't just live here. I am needed here. Uh, I dance here. I sing here. I'm known here and I know people here. And so often what happens in social care is people get defined out of their neighborhood and into a service. And what Martin's been able to do is be alongside Alice and advocate for what matters to Alice and also for the people who matter to Alice. So the people I think around Alice today claim Alice as their neighbor. And so Alice is surrounded by near neighbors, not by salaried strangers. And that's the essence of what has to happen, I think, in the reform of adult social care, that we stop defining people out of services and we start redefining our service in such a way that we can enable people to have a life with services that supplement that life. And so Martin's support and the support of other people, you know, as servants of the whole match, 
Um, and, and that idea of saying, so we swim, all of us, Alice, uh, just like us, swims in what I call a three lane swimming pool. The first and most important lane is what can you do with your neighbors, with your family, with your network? And how do we remove the barriers so you can do that as often as possible? And I don't think we can be independent in that lane unless we're interdependent in that lane. So there are lots and lots of people who don't have those connections or maybe had them, but they, you know, for, for various reasons, they've they've become fragmented. And so I think that's why patch social work and community social work and community development is so important. And sometimes it's necessary to be a bit more intentional to create circles of support um, or indeed, you know, like Georgina, uh, Georgia was talking about there, how do we create circles where the family and friends and neighbours can come together? So that first lane in the swimming pool is really critical. And I think that's a big reform piece. It's a sequential piece because I think the second lane is, OK, what else could you do with a little bit of outside support? And how do we make that outside support on tap rather than on top? So really getting the power uh, in the right order. And then there is a third lane. There are things that we need done for us individually and in our communities. And I think the reform agenda is, can we get that sequence right? So it starts with people in communities. It's supplemented with co-production. And the last resort is the service intervention. And at the moment, it feels like almost because of the way funding is, we're forced into the third lane too quickly. Um, and I think practitioners are as desperate to get into the first lane and work that way as 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 people like Alice. So the winds of change are on our side. We just we need to make sure they're at our sails because, you know, this is going to take some courage. And I, I applaud, uh, you know, Martin and other people who are prepared to work this way and be alongside uh, Alice as she lives her life. Yeah, Kath always says to us, it's a bit like going back to the re the reasons why people came into social work in the first place as well, that original idea, if you like, um, that we're trying to recapture. Um, Tricia, you were you were um, reflecting on that as well. Do you want to come in? Uh, I was, and I'm not quite sure how I can follow Cormac after that, but um, I'm loving the this conversation and being part of this session, actually. Um, in, I think it's about in 2012, I had also done a pilot on um, family and community network conferencing with adults. And I'm a strong advocate of this approach. And we can see very clearly how it works. It just benefits everybody in, involved, actually. But um, hearing Alice's story and watching Martin and Alice talk, what struck me was the ease in which they were conversing. That relationship between the two of them going through this this journey this process um you can see it's just the the relationship that they have built the trust that they have built and with each other and alice um gifting to martin and and not knowing whether to accept or not this is the root of social care of social work having that balance between um supporting people to identify their, their networks of support or helping them to develop that within the community, reaching out, getting out from behind our, our desks, supporting um, those conversations and having that balance then with um, commissioned services. And people don't really, they don't really care where, where their support or their commissioned services come from. It, that's not for them, it's that the support is how they want it to be at the time when they need it in a way that's meaningful for them. Um, and as I say, how can we push this conversation wider and forward at the heart of reform? That's that's how we need to go. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tricia. I, Val, do you want to add anything from your perspective as well? Yeah. I mean, you, uh, we have um, some Tremendous people like Alice in our city as well, don't we? And uh, lots of work like like that going on. Do you want to? We do. We do. And and thank you, Alice. Um, it was really 
great to hear from you. And I've got loads that I could say about social care reform and funding and, and all the rest of it. But I just want if you'll just allow me just a couple of minutes to talk to you about my community, which in Leeds is um, um, a community called Bramley. It's Leeds 13. It's just a regular community, but it's my community and I rather like it. It's got its challenges. It's got its ups and downs. But, you know, it, it belongs to me, so I'm like really invested in it. And we have a shopping centre in Bramley and um, it's a small one. It's got a post office, it's got a bank, it's got a little Tesco because in my world, you go to the big Tesco is out of town, but the little Tesco is just close to. So it's a little Tesco. It's got a chemist, a post office and a bank. And it's got also outside every um, shop, it's got benches. And it's, and it's those benches that Mary, the carer that we support, goes down for a couple of slices of ham every day. Now, it's not good saying to Mary's family, why don't you go to the big Tesco and get a big pack of ham? Because going to the little Tesco at the bottom of the hill every day into her community is so crucial to Mary. Now, it's not particularly exciting, except the benches are where people sit and talk. And Mary talks about the ache in her shoulder and have you been to the doctors? And she talks about her pension because she's just been to pick it up. And she's got a couple of slices to ham and a couple of bits and bobs from the little Tesco. And then we sit outside the little Tesco and we talk and we connect with people. And there's some friends and there's some new faces. There's some old faces. There's young parents. There's kids. And it's lovely to see that connectivity. They don't think they're being involved in community resilience or anything else. They're just being in a community, having a chat. And, and her husband, who she cares for, has got dementia. It's OK for an hour to be left. She feels OK about that, but soon she'll have to get off. We got her a mobile phone. Um, because Leeds have been fabulous in supporting us around the digital offer and helping people who, through um, choice or circumstance, may or may not want to be engaged, but, but Mary did. So a very Tesco phone, and we put two numbers in, her daughter and the taxi service. So at the end of outside, she puts the number in for the taxi service, the taxi comes, and for £3, the taxi takes her up the hill back home and the taxi driver gets out, takes her shopping in, says a little, say hello to her husband and goes. She doesn't, she's not known to social care, nothing. But that bench and what happens on that bench every day with her friends and neighbours and strangers and whatever, she feels safe, connected, she's not lonely and she cares for her husband. Four weeks ago, the new uh, landlord of Bramley Shopping Centre removed all the benches. They said it was a hazard and there's no benches now. And when challenged, which we are, and our local councillors are brilliant and we're fighting this, they said it was a hazard, it, it's not. But if they wanted to, you could sit outside Costa and have a coffee there. Well, Mary ain't tolerating Costa at that price, let me tell you. And so Mary doesn't go down to Little Tesco anymore because she can't have a seat. So her family now do the big shop at Tesco for her and she doesn't leave the house and she's with her husband with dementia. The only reason I say all this, I'm not as articulate as some of the people on this call about what's needed, but all for the sake of a bench. The whole connectivity of somebody with loneliness, social connection, information, what happens in communities, all of those things have gone and the final thing I want to say is just remember it was so much more than just a bench when it comes to people's lives in communities. Val, thanks so much. We, we've had a, a flash mob as well, um, trying to get these benches back in Leeds. Um, so it's a it's an ongoing. Um, I know. And we, it, we keep which, fighting it. But it's just it's that thing about and the community will come together and, um, and 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 we will fight it. And as I as God is my witness on this call, I will take a bench of my own there one day. But we will get Mary back to the little Tesco. We will. We will. Absolutely. Well said, Val. Um, let the, the I was just thinking um, we had a the question from Chris, um, which is, you know, I was just reflecting on the conversation that we've had and how rich it's been and how people 
focused and community focused it's been and then I, I was reflecting on if we'd have had a similar seminar that was sort of led by national organizations and departments and that had been lots of um I, it would just su been such a different conversation and um a different set of issues and um councillor lewis i was just wondering if you might want to reflect on chris's question about can the care system move away from competition and towards partnership because it feels that partnership is the um you know is what we're talking about here to get from that you know those, those three lanes that Carmack was talking about to try and get us working together a bit better i wondered if you might want to come in on on that that issue thanks tom i think um Kath will be far better placed than me to uh, speak about the procurement and commissioning process in its in, in its most um, um, procedural and formal sense. If I can put that put put it that way, but I do um, um, I do think some of the some of the work we need to do needs to be long term, and it needs to have that commitment both to the people we are um, um, entrusted with as councils, but also the people who um uh, the people who work in social care as well and i don't believe um the current system provides that and i think we need to get ourselves into a position where just as a relationship we have with um the third sector is a long-term strategic um um, um relationship we, we challenge each other as um val said um in her earlier comment you know we, we always have the third sector around the table and and, and that is always um, 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 always got to be a, a relationship around a lot of support, but a lot of challenge as well. And if we could get ourselves into that position with the provision of um, home care and residential care, I think it'd be a more positive position for us to be in. But I, at the moment, we don't have um, um, at the moment we don't have the um, structures in place to do that, given the um, procurement um, um, environment we work in. Thank you. And I, I think one of the things that strikes me and has always done as well is that sometimes we, you know, we're forced away from each other in the policy debate. So it's like the ABCD stuff um, almost can't be um, pure if the local authority is sort of dominating it and vice versa for the, it can't be democratic, you know, if it's all about the community. I just wondered, um, Georgia, whether you might want to reflect, you know, reflect on that. How how do we get that balance right? Where you've got, you know, I, I'm so such a believer in local government and the role of, you know, us in enabling things to happen. But we we our role has changed, hasn't it? And it needs to change away from those. We're one of those institutions sometimes that sort of gets in the way, and sometimes we've got to get out the way. It's quite an interesting, you know, grapple for us with this reform agenda. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was reflecting on what Colmat was saying about the patch social work model and the neighbourhood model. And I remember talking to um, one of our more experienced social workers and I was like, oh, we're, we're going to work in this relational way in its neighbourhood. And they're like, OK, yeah, we did that 20 years ago. You, thought, you know, we're like talking about this great innovation. And actually, I think we've moved away from some of the practices that were most powerful and that, that did work. Uh, and it I think the, the kind of journey we certainly went on in Camden and, and having been to Leeds, we've learned a lot from, from the work you've been doing in Leeds for, for longer, is, is that we probably had a safe system. We were keeping people safe, um, uh, but we weren't empowering them to kind of thrive and live full lives. And that has been a real journey for us. And it's a shift in, I think, the way that we work, not just with with people and communities, as you heard, but with with our voluntary sector. And I think, Val, when you talk so powerfully about being equal partners around the table in providing that, and I think it's a really, you know, important relationship that we have in supporting community organisations and community uh, resilience and uh, both the, the kind of formal voluntary sector, but also um, kind of smaller community networks, mutual aid and that, you know, it's not easy always because, you know, we think in a kind of structural way, and safeguarding processes and all these things that are really important and that, has to be a dialogue and a relationship between the two and it's a it's a much more of a kind of capacity building uh, role but it, but the relationship is two way and I think that sometimes when we get stuck as councils as we kind of turn our resource into community organizing and capacity building but then when the community is more powerful and comes to us and says 
okay, this is what we need to do, then that's quite scary and we have to change what we do as an organisation. So I think that that relationship between the two is is really important. And I know there was a question about uh, procurement and getting the same freedoms of the NHS. And it's taken me a while to get my head around this, the question of like changing commissioning. And I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, yeah, but how can we do this without commissioning? And they were like, well, you don't commission libraries, do you? We just deliver them. And, I was, and so I think just kind of understanding actually how we can invest long term in some of these uh, uh, services, hopefully build up our in-house capacity as we're, we're trying to do, but also supporting kind of the voluntary sector mutual models is the kind of, is the journey we need to go on as 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 councils and and yeah we have a lot to learn from from what you've done in Leeds. Great we've really learned from uh, what you've done in Camden as well I've got to say that which is the purpose of these calls actually the these seminars so brilliant stuff. Carmack is there anything we're just coming towards the end so Carmack any final comment that you'd like you'd like to make? I think thanks, Tom, and thanks for having me on this call. It's it's been fascinating to listen to your own respective journeys and your uh, your knowledge exchange with each other, but also your practice. That um, Alice is at the center of our conversation, and Alice's neighborhood is at the center. And I think of Robin, um, who's a citizen of Leeds, that I had the pleasure of meeting, and because of work like Val has described, which is very rooted in place people in the council and people in the third sector have really figured out a different way to be in relationship and to think about a, what a 21st century uh, paid uh, service provider or helper might do. I love the fact that both of you are very much thinking about, in the first instance, how do you support people to come up with a community alternative? You know, so it feels to me like there's a recognition in this call that you can't deinstitutionalize unless you recommunalize. And the mistake that I think social work reform has made in the past, and it's been dogged by, is there's an expose. You know, we now recognize that there are profound limits with congregated care settings. They are not pandemic proof, but I don't think they're modern proof either. I think there's so much better uh, options and possibilities that are out there. But I think the challenge is that unless we come up with a community alternative to congregated care settings, we'll be back to a safety model. And so it feels to me that there's work to be done still and, and different questions need to be asked. Instead of how do we reform our system so it's better, maybe it's about how do we recede associational life so there are better alternatives to our system. And I think in that way, public service is such a profound offer because it's not corporatized. It's not uh, an act of commerce. It's an act of social good that says you'll be a citizen, you'll be free, you'll have a good life. And we'll figure out a way of organizing our resources and our services to enable that to happen. And then we'll back you up with the services as you need them. And I think that's what you're trying to do in Leeds. That's what you're trying to do in Camden. And that's the future in my mind. So onwards and thank you for what you do. Brilliant. Thank you, Carmack. Um, any final um, reflections, Tricia? Um, for me, I think reform means clarity um, and really look thinking about does the government really want to define social care service? The pandemic has highlighted without a doubt that social care is just as important as the NHS. One can't, one service can't exist without the other. Um, and for me, it's the need for us in social care to elevate our confidence and our agency. As a workforce, we are bigger than the NHS in, in numbers, um, but the narrative is always that social care is the minority, the peripheral activity to support the NHS. And we have clearly seen that actually without social care, we have been um, bolstering the NHS throughout the pandemic. And we have, as we've heard today, there have been so many initiatives that we have driven through. We've we have supported people in the communities with um, increased needs like never before. And somehow we need to flip the narrative that's, that's going out now so that this can be recognised and support the workforce. And yes, Kath, we are looking at career pathways and developing skills frameworks and looking at the quality of learning and supervision across all of social care. So I'll be happy to, to have ongoing conversations with you about that. Yeah. That's from me. Brilliant, thank you. And um, ju we're just running out of time. So Val, any any last last quick comment from yourself? 
No, I won't do another and another thing about Bramley. It's just been really great. It's just been really great to hear just so many people talking. And I think everything with that real hearts and minds feel about change. And I think we've got our foot in the door now because I think the pandemic has shown what communities can do, how we did come together. And if we've got our foot in the door, I think that's a really good place to actually start to build on. Brilliant, thank you. And and finally, Councillor Lewis, anything from you before I hand back to Jenny? I think it's these um, conversations around how all of us who were involved, all our different roles, obviously we've had um, councillors, officers, um, um, Alice on earlier and Val, but how those of us are involved in bringing this together really always remember it is um it is people like alice who are who, who we um, um um who we should be focused on and i know sometimes we we get caught in our um bureaucracies and and, and boundaries and it, it's actually it's about people and communities and i know that does sound like um the motherhood and apple pie um slogan but we, we do have to i think i say I, I i am really passionate that, that that's where we get um the best um, um, for people is 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 by uh, looking at um, um, I'm looking at um, I'm, I'm looking at who, who who we're here for and how we can help them and how we can get our um, um, how we can get our organisations and institutions to deliver and not sometimes how people fit into what we want to achieve. Brilliant, thank you. Um, that's been fantastic. Thanks so much to all the panel and to Alice as, and Martin as well. And back to Jenny. So it just remains really for me to thank everyone, especially um, our panellists and especially Alice for sharing her life um, experiences with us. Um, we wanted, in a, when we started this session, we we're talking about what would our lobbying position be and how we've got a window of opportunity right now for real change. Um, and I think we've now got a much stronger sense um, from all of you on what we need to do so that you know local authorities move with our partners to give all our residents a future where they can live in a place they call home with people and things that they love and in communities that look out for one another doing the things that matter most for them and we've heard a lot about the kind of the community i loved the deinstitutionalize and recommunalize so uh, thanks for everyone um i really thought the point about pace of change through the pandemic came up really strongly. We know we can do this and we can do it fast. And I think the point around the original aims of social work being here, I mean, we've, you know, everyone's here ready to do the right thing. Um, so it was a very uplifting session. Thank you. And we look forward to all meeting again soon. I think September's the next discussion. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone.